Hello, my name is Keith Thompson. I'm president of the Nashville Civitan Club this year. I'd like to invite each and every one of you to join us for the upcoming television series, Spirit of Civitan TV. It's going to be on URTV, and we're going to be covering some of the important issues affecting our community. We're going to be meeting some of the civic leaders who are making a difference every day in the lives of our community, and making things better for our children and grandchildren, making this a better place in which to live. So we hope you will be able to join us and watch our series as it comes forward. Thank you. Well, today has been something that I've been looking forward to uh, since uh, the uh, um, Nobel Peace Prize was won by Al Gore and and, and was mentioned uh, somewhat, seems like somewhat as an aside, was that this group uh, which uh, provided the data for that for the for his for his book and and for and for a lot of the people that that analyze uh, climate change and climate data uh, turns out comes right out of downtown Asheville, which is kind of an amazing thing. I guess they have some huge computer down there and and recently in the paper just the other day. Uh, there was another group that's uh, uh, the Weather Hub draws tech firm. Um, so not only uh, um, of, of has it been here for many years, but it's uh, drawing more and more people. I think there was another one that's that's come in. So maybe uh, uh, maybe Jay will fill us in on some of those details. Uh, Jay is from Greenville, went to North Carolina State. Um, uh, wife and three kids, and he's been at uh, NOAA National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, <laughs> Jay, Jay, <laughs> Jay Lorimore, please. Thank you. Thanks, John. Well, thanks a lot for having me. I was telling John earlier that. It's great that there's so much interest in the climate, what is happening with the Earth's climate, um, that, that you wanted me to come and talk to you about it today. I am one of about 160 federal employees at NCDC, the National Climatic Data Center, which is part of NOAA, which is part of the Department of Commerce. And everybody thinks about the Weather Service, and we are within a sister service to the National Weather Service. So the National Weather Service is part of NOAA, mm -hmm. and we are part of the Satellite Service, which is a sister mm -hmm. to the National Weather Service. And as he mentioned, we have had close ties with what has been going on with the study of climate change for many years. I am the chief of what's called the Climate Monitoring Branch. And this branch was established in the late 90s, 1997, 1998, because at that time the administration had a lot of interest in what was happening with the climate and they wanted to better understand it and better help others understand how the climate was changing. And so they came, the administration at that time, came to NCDC on what turned out to be a monthly basis to obtain information on, on the current state of the climate. And we began at that time putting out what we call state of the climate reports, state of the climate. And we're doing this on a monthly basis, month in and month out. We're collecting data from all over the world, not only just not only in the US, but um, across the oceans and across all the lands of the world, inclu including Antarctica. Uh, we use satellite data. We use instrumental data from the surface. And we use radar data and just every kind of data imaginable to understand what's happening with the climate. And so I want to talk to you about what we have learned about the climate and how it's changed. Our focus at NCDC is on the observational record, understanding how the climate has changed. Uh, we have, we are not involved to, to a great extent with projections, what will occur. Other scientists throughout other parts of NOAA, as well as outside of NOAA, are also looking at future changes, but our focus is on using observations to tell us how the climate is changing, how it might be reacting to increases in greenhouse gases. What I want to talk about is how instrumental data tells us how the Earth's climate has changed, and then also other factors. As I tell reporters and others that I talk to, if we had no instrumental observations, no temperature measurements from thermometers, 
and such, we would still know that the Earth's climate is changing because there are other things that are telling us that, like glacier melt and Arctic sea ice retreat, changes in springtime bloom patterns, other things like that. So I'll mention that. I'll throw in a little bit of information on future changes that we expect to occur based on what the scientific body is finding, and then maybe a little bit on impacts if there's time, if there's time to do that. I know everyone's heard about the greenhouse effect, and what is the greenhouse effect? The greenhouse effect is gases in the atmosphere that trap radiation coming from the surface of the Earth. So as the sun shines on the Earth, shortwave radiation comes down, is absorbed at the Earth, and then re-emitted. And the gases in the atmosphere trap that heat that's being emitted from the Earth and allow the, the, the temperature of the Earth to be about 60 degrees Fahrenheit on average, which is a hospitable environment. Well, the concern is that with the emission of green, greenhouse gases, from largely from the burning of fossil fuels, the concentration of the primary greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, has increased about 30% in 150 years. And it's increasing about 1% per year. And there's really no sign that's going to level off anytime soon. And so the concern is as greenhouse gases continue to be emitted and, and build up in the atmosphere, what type of changes might be expected. And so one of the things we do is we study, as I mentioned, the, what has happened, what has been happening over the last decades and, and centuries with the Earth's climate. And as I mentioned, we know that CO2 is increasing. And we also know that the Earth's temperature has increased it's increased about one degree Fahrenheit since 1900, about one degree Fahrenheit, which doesn't sound like a lot, but on a global average, one degree Fahrenheit is, is significant. What's even more significant is that this rate of change, the rate of warming is, is much more rapid, has become much more rapid in the last 30 years, the last three decades. The rate of warming has been about three times greater than what we have seen since 1900. So about a degree Fahrenheit increase since 1900, and now it's increasing at a rate of about three degrees Fahrenheit per century, if it were to continue on this, this rate that we have been on for the last 30 years. And so as greenhouse gases have increased since the start of the Industrial Revolution, global temperatures have been to begin, begun to increase. And there is a lot of year-to-year -year variability. This year is not necessarily warmer than last year, but overall temperatures are rising. And that's a concern, and it's having an effect on other areas of the climate, which I'll mention a bit. I have a map here of global temperatures and how they've changed since 1900. And, and what you would see is that temperatures have risen to the greatest extent in high latitude areas of the northern hemisphere, areas of Canada, areas of Alaska, the Arctic. Alaska, in particular, as an example, is having tremendous problems these days because of the rapid warming there. They're getting a lot of structural damage to buildings, to roads, because the permafrost that they have um, lived with for decades is now melting. Um, there's less of it than there has been in the past. And so some areas outside the U.S. are actually seeing uh, impacts to a greater extent than we are in the mid-latitudes. But the, the, the expectation is that these changes are going to become more rapid, become more frequent and uh, more intense changes in, in things such as heat waves and some other things I'll mention. One of the things in addition to instrumental observations, instrumental being things such as thermometers that we have used since the 1800s to measure temperatures, that provides us perspectives over a century to a century and a half. But we also need information on how the climate has changed before that to give us a better understanding of, of these changes that are occurring now. How do they compare to the climate of 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago? And to understand that, we use what's called paleoclimate records, records from ice cores, uh, tree rings, sedimentary records in lakes and oceans, and things such as coral records in the ocean. And these, these various types of paleoclimate data are put together, and, and they're they're used to understand, as I mentioned, how changes during this century compare to climate change in the past. And what we're finding, what scientists are finding, is that the, 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 how rapid the, the temperatures are warming now 
we've never seen such a rapid rate of, of warming at any time in the past. And so that, that gives us another, another reason to be concerned because looking back even 500 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years ago, we don't see the type of change that's occurring at the, at the rate that we do now. Now, it's not to say that the climate hasn't changed in the past. It certainly has. There have been ice, ice ages in the past, uh, warming in the past, due to, in large part, changes in um, the orbit of the Earth around the sun, such things such as the axial tilt of the Earth. That changes um, on, on scales of tens of thousands of years and the distance of the Earth from the sun and the, and the, the, the orbit going from circular to elliptical all these things come into play, and they've given us changes such as ice ages and warming that I've talked about. But our concern is with the increase in greenhouse gases and changes that we're entering a new realm and changing what we've become accustomed to. That's really the key is that we've become accustomed to a certain type of climate. And as this climate changes, how we built buildings along the coast and other types of, of um, buildings and just become accustomed to a certain type of climate, this climate is now changing. And scientists believe in large part we're part of that reason that the Earth's climate is changing. We've looked at things such as the urban urbanization. There are a lot of, um, there's a lot of interest in, well, we know that we're increasing the amount of buildings, the amount of asphalt in cities. Well, is this a reason why we're, we're observing warmer temperatures? And it is, yes. We know temperatures are warmer in cities, but that's not the reason that global temperatures as a whole are warming. Because if we compare changes occurring on a city scale, on a city basis versus changes in rural areas and changes in oceans, we see that the climate is changing regardless of whether or not you're in a city or not. And so that's been, able, that's been something we've been able to, to look at and find that, yes, in fact, the climate is truly changing as a result of both natural variability and in increasing greenhouse gases. And as I mentioned, temperatures are warming. They're warming on the land surfaces, and they're warming in the ocean. And um, they're also not only warming here at the surface, but they're warming in the atmosphere. We, we use satellite records. We use things such as balloon measurements to look at temperatures in the lower atmosphere, the mid-atmosphere, the upper atmosphere. And we're able to find that these changes that are occurring at the surface, there's also warming occurring in the troposphere as well, above the surface. Precipitation. I've mentioned temperature. I want to mention precipitation. There are changes occurring with precipitation as well, um, both drought-wise as well as heavy precipitation. We've observed increases in precipitation as a whole in many parts of the world. But more importantly, we've also observed that precipitation events are occurring with greater intensity. When they occur, when it rains, we often find that it rains harder. Um, greater amounts of rain occurring over short, shorter amounts of time. And so while we have total precip increasing, we also have the frequency, the intensity of events increasing in many parts of the world. And the concern with this is it can lead to more flooding events, many that we've seen just this past year, places like Washington State, um, the Northeast, areas of other areas of the West. Um, and these types of things are expected to continue as the Earth warms, it's able to hold more moisture. And as it holds more moisture, it's able to give that moisture up in, in faster bursts. And as it does that, um, we get precip in heavier amounts. And in addition to the fact that it can lead to more flooding, it can also actually do damage or, or be counterproductive to actually moistening the soil. When you get precip in heavier amounts and shorter amounts of time, more of it runs off. It doesn't soak into the soil. And so naturally occurring droughts can become more intense because the soil is not getting the moisture that it needs because a lot of it, more of it is running off. The concern is that as the temperatures of the Earth continue to warm, that naturally occurring droughts will become more severe. Because as temperatures warm, you get more evaporation from the soil, more evaporation from vegetation, and so you get greater, you get greater drying. 
Uh, there's actually evidence of increasing drought severity and expanse around the world within the last 30 years as temperatures have warmed. Okay, I mentioned some other things in addition to temperature measurements that tell us that the Earth's climate is warming. High elevation glaciers are retreating almost all over the world. Arctic sea ice, Arctic sea ice has, has fallen to levels never before seen as far as the, the amount of sea ice that, is, that, is, that it melts that melts during the summer in the Arctic. This past year, for the, for the first time, ships were able to traverse the Arctic for five weeks in a row, which that had never been before, before seen for such an extended period of time. Because Arctic sea ice, um, it actually fell, it, it was 23% less than it had ever been before in the summer, in the late summer. When you lose Arctic sea ice, then the ocean, the Arctic Ocean, is, is able to absorb solar radiation at much greater extents. If you have ice and snow, 80% of the solar radiation reflects back to space. You get rid of the ice and snow, the ocean absorbs 80% of the solar radiation coming in. So that allows the Earth to warm at even faster rates than you would have just from increasing greenhouse gases alone. So things such as that, I mentioned permafrost melt. We know the permafrost is melting in Alaska, parts of a lot, large parts of Russia, Canada. Sea level rise, we know the seas are rising. And the extent to which that rise occurs uh, is under study. To, in a, to, to a large extent, the sea level has risen because the ocean is warmed. As the ocean warms, the ocean expands and sea levels, sea levels rise. Well. That's not as much of a concern because it's occurring at a relatively slow rate. The concern is if ice sheets begin to melt at a more rapid rate, the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet, if they melt, begin to melt at a more rapid rate, then the water runs off and fills the seas, and the seas begin to rise at an even more rapid rate than they have been. Now, within, during the 20th century, this did not occur very rapidly. Well, within the last five to 10 years, satellites have been able to detect more rapid melting, particularly in Greenland. And there's concern that this pace of melting of the ice sheets may occur at a more rapid rate than previously expected. If that occurs, then sea levels may rise at a much faster rate than, than currently projected. Hurricanes, you heard a lot about hurricane talk when Katrina hit New Orleans. A lot of concern about is the climate change affecting the intensity, the frequency of hurricanes. There's a lot of debate about that in NOAA. There's no consensus. Some, people, some scientists in NOAA say that we have no firm evidence that hurricanes are becoming more intense because the Earth is warming. You have other scientists that believe we have evidence that points towards stronger hurricanes, particularly in the North Atlantic. My opinion is, I think the jury's still out on this. And in large part, the models will have to improve as well as we'll have to obtain more years of observational records to really get a firm handle on whether or not hurricanes are becoming more intense. Had a map here of billion dollar climate and weather disasters. And one thing that shows is that North Carolina has had more billion dollar weather disasters since 1980 than any other state in the nation. It's actually within, it's tied with Georgia, Alabama, Florida, and Texas within the category of those states that have had the most billion dollar disasters. So if you're concerned about insurance rates, people in the insurance agency, they're looking at areas where um, extreme weather conditions are impacting people, structures, and because we're, we're, we're often impacted by hurricanes, it's not just hurricanes that we're impacted by in the southeast, but also ice storms, uh, hell storms, tornadoes, and many other things that, that can create damages in the billions. And there continues to be a lot of efforts to improve our models, our ability to understand how the climate will change in the future. And while we're not involved in that at NCDC, many other areas of NOAA and other scientists throughout the world are studying 
um, things such as how the Arctic sea ice extent will change in the future. Areas closer to home, the southern pine beetle infestation of insects such as the pine beetle are becoming more frequent and causing greater damage because they're able to survive the winter in greater numbers because winters are warmer and with more frequent droughts, more intense droughts, which damage, which weaken trees, then the, the beetles and other insects are able to infest in greater numbers. And so that's a concern going forward as well. Pollution is also a concern. Pollution becoming more uh, intense, uh, and, and pollution events becoming more frequent, more severe. Mitigation and response, things that can be done one thing is improving technologies to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. And a lot of focus, now there's a lot of focus today on improving technologies to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and, and other pollutants as well. And going into the future as technologies improve and conservation practices improve as well, uh, there's hope that this rate of increase of greenhouse gases will slow and eventually be able to decline. Lastly, there are efforts underway to be able to deal with drought and to adapt, um, not just to drought, but to other changes in the Earth's climate. Things in such as the transportation sector, looking at how high bridges need to be built, um, how roads can be constructed to better deal with warmer temperatures, more severe weather. A lot, a lot of municip municipalities, Asheville being one, are looking at the potential impact of climate change on communities and how communities need to be preparing now to better deal with more severe events, more extreme weather, worse drought. So a lot's being done. There's a recognition of the, not only the impacts that have occurred, but future potential impacts. And so there's a lot to be, there's a lot to, um, to be positive about because there is a recognition that the climate is changing and that, that a lot of people are doing something not only to study, to better, under, to better understand how the climate will change in the future, but also how we can be better prepared for these changes that are certainly to occur. So that's all I have. If anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to take them. Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. I, my question uh, in part is because uh, the National Climatic Data Center's uh, being a part of the Asheville community and economy, I understand that you ha the consumers of the products that you create from all of the data that you collect include the uh, not only the insurance industry that you mentioned, but the uh, weather reporting media and also the Pentagon. Is the Pentagon using you as a source of guidance and planning? The Pentagon does use climate data that is collected at NCDC. There is also an organization here, an Air Force organization, that occupies the same building that we do. It was called the Air Force Combat Climatology Center. Now it's called the 14th Weather Squadron. and we do work closely with the Air Force, and we share data, we share expertise, we share methods of monitoring the climate, and this information is used by the Air Force for planning purposes. Myself, I was, I spent several months in Iraq in 2004 with the 1st Infantry, Infantry Division, because I'm also a member of uh, the North Carolina Air National Guard, I'm commander of a weather flight there. And so I, I had the privilege of, of serving some time in Iraq, and while I was there, I did have communication back with uh, a number of people here in Asheville to obtain data to, uh, to better plan for, to better, to better understand what the climate conditions, what the weather conditions were likely to be in the future, because in looking out in planning missions, you're not only looking at what conditions will be like tomorrow, but for missions, missions that 
would be a month in advance or maybe two months in advance. So planning takes place at all scales, from days to months to even beyond. And so our ability to not only forecast the weather over short time periods, but also to understand what the climate conditions will be like next month, next season, and in years to come is, is very important. My question is about the ice core samples that is, are used to uh, show what the climate conditions were many years ago. And I understand these go back something like 400,000 years. And my question is, what kind of resolution do they have when they take these cores? When they say, it, did it happen plus or minus one year or plus or minus 100 years? When they plot it, what is that? Do you know what that resolution is? Well, the, the resolution can vary depending on the quality, quality of the ice core. However, most often it's, it's difficult for me to say precisely what the resolution is. Uh, we have a branch at NCDC called the Paleoclimate Branch, and they're actually located in Boulder, Colorado, although they're part of the National Climatic Data Center. And they have a focus on not only ice core records, but also um, things such as tree rings and the sedimentary records I mentioned. Um, and there can be a, there can be a wide variation in, in the resolution. But typically, um, if we're able to understand going back hundreds of thousands of years, if we're able to, to understand changes that occur on, on the scale of hundreds and thousands of years, that's still very useful information. Uh, I wanted to ask just a, 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 uh, two, two quick ones. Well, one of them is that you hear that there's a, uh, that there's a deeper snowpack. Uh, I think it's Antarctica. And people point to that as though this is not a global warming issue. Uh, do you know anything about that, that there's more snow now, uh, even though there are fewer glaciers in the Antarctic? Well, the issue with Antarctica is that we don't see the same type of loss of Arctic sea ice uh, that we do in the Arctic, in the northern hemisphere. And we also don't see, over the center of Antarctica, we don't see the same type of warming that we do see in the Antarctic Peninsula. The Antarctic Peninsula has been warming at, uh, at rapid rates, but we're not seeing that in the center of Antarctica. And there are different uh, uh, theories on this. Uh, part of it is, is thought to be due to reductions in stratospheric ozone, um, the ozone hole in the Antarctic having an impact on circulation and there's thought that circulation around, around Antarctica is stronger, and this can be actually um, slowing down, um, for instance, the intrusion of warmer seawaters from outside the Antarctic, and that being one reason why we haven't seen reductions in Antarctic sea ice like we have with Arctic sea ice. Another thing to keep in mind with the Arctic is the Arctic Ocean is surrounded by landmass, northern hemisphere, and the land masses, as I mentioned, are warming very rapidly. And that's also having um, a, a, an impact on the rate of, of loss of Arctic sea ice. Whereas in the, in, in the Antarctic, you have a very cold continent, that being surrounded by ocean water. And as I mentioned, with the circulation, ocean circulation around the Antarctic, uh, Arctic, uh, warmer sea, sea, sea waters don't often are allowed to intrude, not allowed to intrude into the, into, and melt the Arctic sea, uh, Antarctic sea ice. Well, thank you.